they do. We feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Eoğlan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne azdır. And I'm feeling that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why do you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varg Blog. And here we are with Ravana, um, who I know mostly. I know you from the Red Flag podcast because I know Kenzo and mm -hmm. Forrest. Um, but you're also a TYT Twitch streamer. You do your own show. I think you do Taking the L. Mm -hmm. um, you become a streaming and podcast sort of uh, mini network. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm in the industry. <laughs> yep. It's weird to think about it as an industry because when I started this a decade ago, it was a hobby. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so there's there's a whole lot that's happened in the last month, two months. Um, <laughs> it feels like lately um, the the apocryphal Lenin quote about their their weeks where years happen um, has been every week for the last two years. So I feel mm -hmm. like. Like a couple of decades have happened. Um, sadly, it turns out Lennon didn't actually say that. That was probably first said by George Galloway and attributed to Lennon. But whatever, it's still true. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the big thing we have to deal with right now is the Democrats' response to the reversal of Roe v. Wade, despite the fact they knew uh, that it was coming. Um, yeah. And... Um, that has led to a lot of protesting and a lot of a lot of fear. Um, uh, wh what do you think the Democrats are doing right now in regards to this? And how would you break their break the various responses up? So it's they've had so much time to prepare that I don't want to give them any excuses um, <laughs> for their inaction because I, you know, I I will give it up to the House. I suppose they've passed quite a few bills in the House. Um, one to codify Roe and then several others to protect abortion rights. They just passed um, a bill to protect reproductive rights for uh, incarcerated women and they'll all die in the Senate. So legislatively, it's difficult. There's many things that Joe Biden could independently do that he dragged his feet on doing until he was pressured by activists mostly. Um, and uh, I mean, his plummeting approval rating, I'm sure, had some impact on <laughs> decision to do some things um but even those are not as far as they could go um but i mean it, it like you mentioned they've had so much time to prepare they've had decades it's been like a since the passage of roe this project to reverse it has been in place and they've known about it it's not been done in the shadows like networks like the Federalist Society, this is what they were created to do. <laughs> right. Like not, not just Roe specifically, but to to reverse, you know, all types of civil rights and to, uh, you know, advocate for the rights of corporations over the rights of individuals. And I mean, they're the reason we have essentially Citizens United, um, which has destroyed whatever tiny semblance of democracy we had in this country. So I mean, these organizations have been operating in the open, They've not been quiet about what they're doing. We've seen like networks like Right to Life and other anti-abortion pro-force birth networks. Um, and the Democrats did nothing. They fundraised and they fundraised and they gave lip service to doing something. But, you know, when they actually had the ability to codify Roe, they didn't do it. And right. Obama said it was not a legislative priority for him. They didn't do it. Um, right. So now we are here and they're left to clean up a mess that they watched happen and did nothing to prevent. One of the things about the Democratic supermajority, and I have to remind people who tend to only talk about the, the Obama administration post-2010, that Obama came in with the largest Democratic supermajority that we had seen since the 50s. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it really... Um, in all of modern politics, since the development of formal mass media, uh, we 
we had not seen a supermajority like that. And the the legislative agenda was stalled quite similarly to the way it's stalled now. And we probably we'll come back to this when we talk about Joe Manchin later. Mm-hmm. But it's it was a bigger deal in many ways because there were many, many, many legislative things on the table. Codifying Roe was one of them that Obama promised. Um, another one was uh, uh, stop car uh, stop car check things to, to increase union organization stuff, which he dropped. Mm-hmm. Um, dropped uh, public option. Public option abolishing Gitmo. Yeah. Um, one of the most frustrating things now, I think, for people to look at, and I don't think people want to look at it, is actually, despite Joe Manchin and Christian Cinema, and despite the emergence of the squad, um, this actually is the most ideologically cohesive Democratic Party we've actually seen yeah. in modern history. And they still can't or don't want to get anything done. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I wanted to ask you: Do you think it's can't, or do you think it doesn't? Do you think it isn't doesn't want to? I I actually don't know. And while while I give uh, you know I want to give the House credit, I'm sure some of those people are sincere. It also strikes me as weird that we only get bills out of the House that they know often cannot pass the Senate. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I get think, the gesture, but I think it's a combination of can't and won't. I think that um, particularly. Um, oh, why is the name escaping me? The, the leader of the Senate Democrats, Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer is like obsessed with the Democrats public image and is terrified to do anything that he thinks might reflect poorly on them or anything that he thinks they, that the Republicans could spin against them, which is what the Republicans are going to do anyway. But it's like, uh, and he's not, a he does, there's not a good Senate whip. There's not a good, you know, he doesn't have strong command of the, the Democrats in the Senate. Um, and he's a feckless loser. So the Senate continues to lose. Um, and the House can put through as many bills as they want on things like abortion, on climate change and what have you. But the the Democrats in the Senate aren't going to fucking step up to the plate. And for when it, people like Joe Manchin, of course, it's a won't. But for the rest of the party, it, it's... It's a, a too afraid to try. I mean, not for all of the Senate. There's some, you know, pretty good senators uh, in the Democratic caucus in uh, right now. But, you know, for the leadership of the party, truly, it is a too afraid to fall. So we won't even try. We, we, are, we are so scared of expending whatever, like, misperception they have of, of like, their limited political capital and, and public backing and the popularity of these things. Because they're super popular, right? Codifying Roe, fairly popular within the Democratic Party and the voters, massively popular. Climate change initiatives, popular. <laughs> you know, child tax credit, massively popular. But they're just not even willing to fight for them. Um, which, to, to some, for some of them, it's it's about their donors. But for some of them, it's just about, you know, n- not willing to put up a fight and not knowing how to do it because they've always just rolled over. Well, as a person who often pushes back on the idea that FDR was somehow a socialist, I have been really struck by the difference in um, what what Democrats tend to learn from FDR. So, for example, they talk about how the court packing scheme was pushed back on it didn't work. And, yeah, FDR didn't get the court packed. However, um, the court quit taking as many cases. Mm-hmm to undermine FDR's agenda after that move. So while yeah. no side got what they wanted, um, it wasn't like the court just backed away. Now, John Roberts has been afraid of, you know, also actually he's kind of the, the opposite and judicial version of a, of a Joe Biden in this, mm-hmm. uh, of, of his conservative activism being unpopular because they know that a lot of what they want to do does not have broad popular support. Um, however, uh, it also seems like that approach doesn't really have much, much teeth if they don't think there ever be repercussions from the Democrats and the Democrats act as if there's nothing they could do. 
Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, and to me, Roe is the most pronounced version of this because this is, this is a half century long conservative victory that's happening when the Democrats control two of the three branches of government. Yeah. Um, which is always going to reflect poorly on the Democrats because regardless of, you know, the fact that they don't have the ability or carte blanche to just, I mean, technically to just put whoever they want on the court, they could through court packing, he won't do it. But, um, you know, people will still view that as a, this happened under Joe Biden, right? That's just how the average person is going to view these events. Not like, oh, this happened because of the Federalist Society's like <laughs> decades long project to pack the court system. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I mean, I think one of the most damning things that came out about this, and yes, Biden eventually capitulated and did not, did not uh, appoint this judge, but that Biden, with no quid pro quo deal intact, had actually agreed to appoint anti-choice judges, even knowing the likelihood of this ruling happening. Yeah. Which doesn't bode well. And then you have the fact that there are at least... Um, that there are several anti-choice members of the of the Democratic Party that have even beyond this been protected by the DNC while they're saying they're involved in protecting women's rights. Um, uh, um, that Henry Cuellar. Cuellar, yes, exactly. Um, it, you know, I was about to say South Texas guy Cuellar mm -hmm. uh, is, is a perfect example of this, but also like Tom Kane. Uh, <laughs> like you know, Tim Kaine in the membrane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good old Tim Kaine. You know, uh, Mr. Vice President for Hillary Clinton. Um, it's just the dumbest choice they could right. have pulled. <laughs> uh, you know, it it well, but, but it, there's a tradition of this. I think of Al Gore and Joe Lieberman. Like, yeah. uh, the fact that these these Atari Democrat instincts from 1984 have not been adjusted. Um, even after Obama indicates to me that they're not going to be that, yeah. that it, and I don't know how left, I think left, I should be worried about this, but it makes me feel like it's like watching um, what we've seen with labor in the UK where labor is basically now a permanent opposition party that doesn't have any real say in government, no matter what happens with the Tories. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems kind of like, that may be where a lot of the Democratic Party is going. And, I, and I'll give another example of this. During this time period, we see this uh, this Newsom ad in Florida, which is really aimed at getting corporations to values come to California. Um, but it claims to be to try to get people to move from Florida to California. As an electoral policy standard for the nation, that's actually idiotic. Mm -hmm. Like, to get people to vacate what used to be a purple state for a democratically underrepresented blue state makes no sense as a strategy. Yeah. So but that's, that's what you come to expect from the democratic party. Yeah. But it, you know, I mean, it's it sometimes it's really, I, I agree with some of its incompetence, but it, it really is almost, it's so incompetent. It's, it, it's, it's got to be willful at some level. Yeah. I mean, um, I feel like the way that James Carville shaped the Democratic Party's strategy for campaigns, the damage will never be undone. Because although, you know, I mean, strategically, maybe it was smart in the 90s. Um, it <laughs> The move to the center, the move to the right, really, the, you know, distance from the, uh, you know, activist wing of the party cutting ties with organizations doing, you know, actual organizing on the ground, embracing, uh, you know, corporatism. That is why we are where we are today. And that's why the Democrats were unable to fight back against things like the, the Republican plan to re uh, reverse row. But like, that's just the type of things that it's like a, an outdated mindset um, that, just continues to lose i mean the, the if you look at the the leadership there, uh, in the d triple c and just dnc in general it's losers they'll bring in people who lost their elections i mean obama stepped in and endorsed tom perez 
uh, over Keith Ellison to head the DNC. Keith Ellison, who, you know, <laughs> that he literally is the, the only reason Tom Perez won that was because of Obama. But Keith Ellison was someone who proved himself to, to actually know how to organize and run <laughs> a successful campaign, as opposed to Tom Perez, who needed Obama to give him CPR and to push him across the finish line. Like, they hire losers who don't have a cohesive strategy or experience winning. They don't know how to win. They know how to lose. And they employ those losing strategies, you know, uh, across all this in, in races across all the states and they then they choose not to run candidates in districts where they probably should be focusing more energy but i mean just they're just losers they're just big losers <laughs> well i think about this uh, there, there there seems to be an addiction um we're not just in hillary clinton right that's the obvious one you run someone who loses the primary in 08 again in in 2016 and they're utterly shocked when yes, a minority probability happens, but it happens. Yeah. Um, but there's other, you know, the obsession with people who continually lose is actually something I see particularly with the Democrats. Biden himself is one of them. How many times has Biden run for president? A ton, like three times before this. Right. Um, one time he he had to step down because he was caught plagiarizing. Correct. That that's actually my first memory of him. I, I'm significantly <laughs> older than you, so yes, I remember when that happened. Um, we and and Biden temperamentally. Um, I don't want to get into the man's faith, uh, but temperamentally also, he was a pro life Democrat for a long time. Yeah. Um, he has since relegated his pro-lifeness to personal choice and, um, and, and what have you. And I, I don't think that's totally insincere. I have no reason to believe that it's insincere, but this is not a major issue for him. Yeah. But, it, but it's also hard for me to imagine what is a major issue for him, including his continued presidency. Like, yeah. um, one thing I have to say, though, uh, it does make a lot of the left, which felt like we had Biden from the threat of Bernie Sanders, uh, at least making concessions to us rhetorically in 2020 when he came when he came in office. And he he did. His speeches were filled with things that sounded vaguely at least Fordist, if not uh, beyond to classical social democracy. Um, it kind of makes us look dumb, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, we've gotten on the train, but I, I don't I don't want to call out names, but there are people on the social left left who have a higher profile than me and you who were talking about how Biden was being forced to catch up with the times because of the situation on the ground. And even if that were true, it hasn't mattered to the Democratic Party as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because if they wanted a candidate because who's going to be prepared for this? they knew the makeup of the Supreme court going into the election, they wouldn't have nominated Joe Biden. It's as simple as that. They were, they were fine with having a president who this is not a priority for him personally or politically. He's not going to be a strong advocate for abortion rights. He won't say the word abortion. He'll shy away from it. <laughs> like when Bernie Sanders is someone who obviously this is something that he cared about. This is something that he would come out strong on. Um, it, it's it's just the whole party through Joe Biden and through their nominating Joe Biden, through their forcing him on us, um, was saying that this is not a priority. That coupled with the fact that, again, they sat on their hands for like 50 years and let this happen. You know, it's it's just Biden nor the DNC cared to catch up with the times until it was, you know, okay, well, now we have to fundraise. So now we can send out these emails, whatever, whatever. Are we actually going to do anything effective? Maybe if, if, if we think it will help us win in November, but we'll see when it comes time. Hmm. You know, it, it, it kind of has been the lesson since 1972 and the initial failure of the priorly popular um, equal rights amendment that the Democrats have foregone um, any legislative uh, attempt to codify these rights. And, and I will say that even 
And actually, I have a hard time forgetting Ruth ba forgiving Ruth Bader Ginsburg for this because Ruth Bader Ginsburg pointed out in her own legal brief that the legal logic for uh, Roe v. Wade, the way it was argued as a compromised position off an implied right of an implied right off due process, um, was actually pretty legally precarious, that it wouldn't be that hard for a conservative court to come up with a legal logic to undo it. Um, but even more damning is how much legislation and, and, and was not passed and how many future rulings were based off of substantive due process, which has now been gutted. Yeah. Um, yeah the obvious is a burger fell, but, Lawrence versus Texas, um, even Lo uh, Love Lover Lover Beaver, Virginia, Virginia yeah. the one that Claire Thomas did not mention for some reason. absent from his <laughs> his uh, <laughs> his concurrence, of course. <laughs> Although I don't know, maybe maybe he's uh, you know coming at it in, in a stealth way as a way to get out of his marriage to his crazy wife. <laughs> Fair. Um, but I mean, today the Democrats did pass, um, what was it called? The Respect for Marriage Act, which would codify uh, Obergefell. But again, and it had bipartisan support in the House, actually. Um, but is it going to pass the Senate? Uh, I still don't know. Probably not. I mean, that's, there's a chance it, it could, but I'm, you know, I'm sure Mitch McConnell would never, would never, you know, take his hand off the throats of his uh, of his Senate Republicans and let any of them vote for it. But what is interesting is this does actually lead to a certain kind of logic that, that is unfortunate. And I think we saw this even in the, in the initial COVID relief act um, that if there is a Republican president, there is a, there is a chance that Mitch McConnell will actually let his hand off the throttle on something like a marriage protection act that protects gay marriage. Cause he knows that even on a lot of conservative States that that would particularly amongst the under 40 set, set people off. Um, it's w even more than abortion. It's actually an issue that, and unle that unless you are literally a baby boomer has pretty much been settled. Now yeah. I do want to remind people that reactionary baby boomers who we thought went away all you have to do is read any newspaper comments section to be reminded that no, oh. <laughs> they, they not only exist, but they do really want to get rid of you. And there's a few reactionaries who would love to do it for them. Um, but they are only about 25% of the country, probably. That said, 25% of 300 and something million is a lot of people. Yeah. You know. Um, but support for marriage equality has never been higher among the right. American population. So naturally, of course, I don't expect the Senate to pass this because God forbid they pass a single piece of legislation that is popular amongst one Democratic constituents. Jesus Christ, it's like a, a huge, vast majority of Democratic voters support marriage equality. Um, but I mean, just popular in general, even, you know, it's more popular among Republican voters than it's ever been. Like, right. for the love of God, pass this shit. <laughs> yeah, that, that 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 seems like a cultural argument that really has been won. That in interracial marriage. And and there are AGs, there are attorney generals right now who are perfectly willing to even go after Loving versus Virginia yeah. for a few for a few votes. What I I do appreciate that like a lot of things post 2015, um all the stuff was in code between 2008 and and let's say the beginning of the Trump era, it's not in code anymore. Um, and it's amazing. Now it, it's amazing how I think the Democrats have rested on the fact that it is socially on that social opinions on their side. So they haven't had to do anything about that, mm -hmm. but clearly, you know, I mean, but it's similar to like uh socialized, socialized medicine or at least a single uh, single payer option um that polls well in red states and it yeah. has for a long long time actually polls like, really well in west virginia <laughs> yeah um my my ross perot my my ross perot supporting father uh 
uh, be, was actually radicalized and became more and more friendly to progressives based off of that single issue, um, hmm. uh, which is which is quite interesting. Um, I criticized James Carville earlier, but he did say something really funny at the end of the campaign. Uh, the was it 92 mm -hmm. campaign cycle he said that ross perot's campaign was the single most expensive act of masturbation <laughs> <laughs> in mankind and it was it's true and it's funny but you know without ross perot there's a good chance that bill clinton would not have been president so right and there's also a good chance that trump would have never ideologically existed that's true too <laughs> um uh, i always like to remind people that that the the, the reform party after Nader abandoned it, um, when he became the in a coalition with it with after Ross Perot, the 2000 election Reform Party election was a fight between Buchanan and Trump, um, which is kind of hilarious to think about, particularly given how much of Buchanan's politics Trump actually took on. Um, but what's a Marxist to do about this? I don't know if you're a Marxist, but we are here. Um, uh, I, I do know that you're a socialist and it's interesting you coming out of the TYT sphere uh, because that has been drifting left for a long time. Um, I will spare you my, I'm, I'm, I don't want to put you in an awkward spot about how much I've been, how much fun I've made of Sink Uger for two decades, but that's okay. Everyone uh, has, <laughs> um, but uh, it's been interesting watching uh, Anna come out as being moving from a progressive to a socialist over the course of about 15 years, I think it's been something that I've been seeing her do. Um, how much, I, this is a, this is a, a question that I have asked. Uh, I asked Michael Brooks way back in the day too, when he was working with Sam Cedar. Um, how much has the socialist and progressive allegiance changed the nature of progressivism or has it changed the nature of socialism? Like, do you have an opinion about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that there was a time where progressives were, and I hate that term. <laughs> I've hated it for a while. I guess when I like first started giving a shit about like, when I first realized that you didn't have to like be a lib to like, you know, if you were interested in politics or I was like, okay, yeah, I'm a progressive. That's cool. That's different. Before I, you know, found socialism and, theory and read things for the first time in my life but um there was at that time i feel like progressives were really really staunchly trying to separate themselves from socialists like they wanted to disavow you know it was a dirty word the the idea of like having any sort of like ties to socialists communists what have you is bad we have to operate within the framework of capitalism we have to you know, we have to reform capitalism. Whereas now I see, I see a lot more people using the, I'd, I'd say that the word progressive has shifted to leftist and it's more catch all for, for everyone left of the democratic party. But you know, people, people are progressives within this leftist term, whatever are, are less scared to embrace socialism, less scared to criticize capitalism less afraid to point to the fact that capitalism is the root to so many of the ills they've already been criticizing, but you know, we're on the surface level of, and not actually getting into the, the, the true source of these problems. Um, and, and I think that's helpful because I, you know, at the end of the day, we need people to, to fight against this and the less people who are, uh, or the more people who are opening their eyes to the fact that yes, it is capitalism is the root of so many of, of the problems they're experiencing and you could feel it in your day-to-day -day life, you know, money in politics is something that progressives have been criticizing for, for since uh, citizens United and before that even, but you know, particularly since that, but now it's more, it's not just money in politics, it's money in politics because of capitalism. Capitalism creates, creates a, a, a door for money into politics in a way that socialism doesn't. So even if they're not willing to, call themselves socialists or if they're not necessarily willing to advocate, you know, for a dictatorship of the proletariat, <laughs> proletariat, you know, they're still like, they're willing to criticize capitalism and that's a start. So I, th I think that it's definitely moved in, in a good direction. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, we're still, <laughs> there's still a lot of a fight to, to be had, especially when it comes to 
first and foremost fighting for any sort of representation within the only viable left wing party, <laughs> left wing party, yeah. as far as electoralism goes. Well, it, 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 I am always torn about having to work with the Democrats. I push back on uh, on it some, um, but I've also I also have admitted that there there are certain places that if you even want to get ballot access, you're going to have to run as a Democrat or a Republican, and you, you should you should basically make that call based on the where you're at. Um, I also, however, do think when we can, and particularly in local politics, we should probably run on our own. Mm -hmm. um uh and i don't even think that's controversial within the dsa it's just it's just there's so much of a focus on national politics yes um one thing that i think that i i do think is actually finally getting through to people on all the political spectrum um is how much even though we have won nationally over and over again the fact that we have not had a local and state game in a lot of parts of the country that aren't basically fairly well off urban areas uh, is incredibly detrimental. But mm -hmm. I think what the Democrats have taken away from that is a triangulation strategy. And I think Joe Manchin, to turn to another point I know we wanted to talk about today, and Kristen Cinema are the ultimate results of the, of the triangulation strategy, which I think makes them look weak yeah. and, and also bloodless. And I think they've been told that publicly now for two whole decades since the end of the Clinton administration, and it has not sunken in. So mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of that? And how do you feel about Joe Manchin? How much how much of this is Joe Manchin's fault? Well, I mean, Joe Manchin is a product of the Democratic Party allowing someone like Joe Manchin to be within their party. So, uh, you know, I mean, to, to, to that extent, of, he's the person he was always going to be. He's always going to be the fossil fuel, uh, you know, advocate he's always going to represent his uh his daughter's interests <laughs> her financial interests you know in the senate and uh i mean kirsten cinema to a lesser extent she presented herself differently than she ended up becoming well, she was a green party member and uh, even as late as 2000 and what 17 or 18 people were saying she was one of the most promising progressives in, <laughs> yeah in, in government which is hilarious yeah, but. it is <laughs> but i mean i mean so so i i fault them a little less for her um but you know joe manchin is is a product of of the democratic competence but just to that extent like uh not allowing the such a i mean and like you mentioned earlier they're they're pretty ideologically uh cohesive say for someone like joe manchin relative to the rest of the history of the democratic party but there's it's it's the desperate need to have someone telling you you can't do what you want to do that you can't accomplish what you think you could accomplish like for obama that was rahm emanuel fuck rahm emanuel <laughs> i hate him so much another um, person that i used to be told was a progressive in the early aughts by the way i know that's a long time ago but i remember people talking about how we needed more rahm emanuels to fight for progressive causes the person who almost single-handedly killed the fucking yep. public option before it was a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and was one of the worst, <laughs> one of the worst uh, elected officials in Illinois. That we which, is yes. which is impressive. Which is impressive because it's not not exactly a state known for its competent uh, and definitely staying within the uh, coloring honest... inside the lines legally <laughs> <laughs> politicians. <laughs> but yeah, just, I mean, it's, it's a, the democratic party is a nightmare in, in that sense, but to, to what you were saying, it is, there is like a one fault of people on the left, I think. And you mentioned this is a hyper fixation on national politics when there is so because you really can run not as a democrat or republican in a lot of local races you don't have to, there's many positions where you don't even have to announce a party you just run as yourself and um so places where where you know it would be harder to run as a democrat in that area you can run without a party affiliation for a local position and do good in that position and because so many so many things that impact our lives on the day-to-day -day are happening state and local right and and this 
uh, Republicans understand that. That's why they are fucking getting every every wine mom with a, a you know a lifted jeep and a Trump flag off the back to run for school board. Right. Like the yeah, amount they, of yeah, they've Sorry, effectively taken over even rural cities and bright blue states like in Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this has been missed. And I'm like, no, they. You know, I mean, and in some of those states, actually, they've been taken over by the most extreme elements of the party. Yeah. Um, uh, and and I have also noticed the 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 Republican ability to bait progressives into incoherence with uh, by finding said wine mom or said uh, gun coffee shop owner or uh, weird conspiracy yoga mom. <laughs> to to represent the most r radical elements of the party, but also to bait a lot of progressive commentators into saying really reactionary things. Mm -hmm. um, and thus being able to throw that back at them too simultaneously. Yeah. Um, uh, and it seems to be more, it seems to have been a more successful tactic with them on, on, on the why mom contingent than it has been on say, finding black conservatives to do it. They have been less successful with that. Although yeah. with, with Latino, with the, with the Latin demographic, I don't know that we're going to be, that they may have found a better strategy there. Well, there was just that woman who won in Texas, a race mm -hmm. that, yeah, they were calling her Miss Free Hole. Oh yeah. It's like, what on God's green fucking earth did you think you were doing here? <laughs> like just, playing into the the fucking narrative they already had which was that democrats are racist like they're they they don't care about you know it's like a, a deeply mexican district they don't care about your interests they 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 you know they don't care about you they just want your vote and now you're calling the candidate the republican candidate miss free hole like yeah no fuck of course they're gonna not vote for you what kind of strategy is that <laughs> No, it, it, it's it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. I think we're going to see more and more of. I I pointed out, for example, that the national conservative movement not only has it been able to get certain leftists to work with them, um, unfortunately, but yeah. it's also been very good at making sure that its public facing leadership is not ang is not Anglo white. Um, yeah. and I think that has been pronouncedly missed. Uh, because of a lot of people thinking that they were always going to be, bef I mean, Richard Spencer's a lot harder to fight than, I mean, a lot easier to fight than somebody who is, say, a, a, almost a monarchist Catholic, but can sound good on workers' issues and uh, can appeal to people of color. Yeah. Um, so... I guess this, though, I, I, to me, the other elephant in the room, that, that, before we really get into the Joe Manchin problem, is also the Democrats' seeming incoherence on in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And and the big one is even... Uh, I will give Ro, uh, Ro Khanna... Uh, Rohana. Ro Khanna, yeah. Yeah, Ro Khanna. I'm making sure I got my names right. Um, proper credit for standing against it in the beginning and now, but during the height of the Ukraine thing... The expansion of the military budget and even the progress, all the progressives and stuff completely rolling without any concession on that was worrying um, because it, it it's I admit the situation in Ukraine is actually hard to parse as a narrative um, mm -hmm. um, because it, you know, um, NATO doesn't look good. Russia doesn't look good. Parts of Ukraine don't even look good. Um, but. It was an immediate gain to certain parts of the Republicans to say, well, look, they're not passing anything for you, but they can write a check of, what, uh, $48 billion without any strings attached to the Ukrainian government. Um, have a nice day. Yeah. They, they can't do anything about inflation nor pass any uh, social welfare laws. Couldn't even renew the child tax credit. Yeah. I mean, as it's... In, yeah. yeah. As anemic as that is. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and I'm now even accepted the, the narrative that the child trash credit was a contributor to inflation without a whole lot of evidence. Um, 
I mean, that's and that ties back into the Joe Manchin problem, right? Because that's been his bullshit. We can't support. And right now, and uh, oh, what's that guy's name? New York Times uh, editorial. Krugman? Uh, David Brooks. Brooks. Okay, yes. Yeah, he went on uh, uh, Meet the Press, I think it was, and was sucking off Joe Manchin, saying things like, oh, he warned us that th- that passing Build Back Better would cause inflation, and look where we are right now. He was right. Like, we didn't pass it. He can't be right. What do you mean? He didn't predict. He predicted that passing these substantial bills would increase inflation. Inflation increased, but we didn't pass the bills. So so now he's taking a victory lap, you know, saying that it's uh, that he was right. And it's ridiculous. <laughs> and well, I mean, David Brooks, you should never trust anyway. I, but part of I will say, though, the, uh, the I want to say even the quote again, we're going to use the dreaded P word, the progressives. <laughs> it was more when Krugman was actually talking about the need for higher unemployment that I was shocked. And I was like, you were the coin guy six years ago. <laughs> like you were almost a modern monetary theorist. What the hell happened? <laughs> um, and so that's when I started really wondering, like, because what I've seen is not just a David Brooks, though. I mean, David Brooks has been a chode forever. Yeah. Um, David Brooks but, and his child bride. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but, but the entirety of this, of this New York times apparatus also has been like this, like, yeah. Um, and you know, I, I know a lot of people think that Joe Biden may still forgive student loans or whatever. I, I don't think so. Um, I think he might stall them until November, but yeah. Um, uh, it, it seems like one of the interesting things is the New York Times prime ideological role uh, and the Washington Post prime ideological role was to, again, make the war spending okay, but any other kind of spending, including are including just the forgiving of debts. Mm-hmm. not okay um off of very selective readings of moral hazard and tying that into inflation without acknowledging that inflation is na- is transnational and thus cannot be dependent on any one country's policy that it has to, there's a lot of things there, there's more than one thing driving it i think mm-hmm. supply chains are part of it um, and I was very skeptical early on when the when the Biden administration was like, oh, no, it's just going to be for a little while. I was like, no, it's not. But <laughs> but it's not about these small marginal policies or even labor gains, because even conservative um, economists have said that if you actually look at the amount of inflation and labor costs, which have been going up, admittedly, to the the overall inflation it could only explain one percent of the extra inflation well we've been up to eight or nine percent now so that's not explaining it either yeah um it's not really about i mean I, i'm going to say this it's not really about the quote monetary creation problem it's about other issues driving this including the global breakdown of supply chains uh energy costs being through the roof because, well, all that stuff the environmentalists were worrying about, they weren't wrong. <laughs> and um, the fact that the glo- the geopolitical trade networks have been politically breaking down now for 10 years. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, I don't mean to be ranty. You're the guest. But like... No, the, it's the, fine. <laughs> these are things that 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 I that drive me up the wall with, with these Democrats. Um so what can you do about Joe Manchin? Um, <sighs> Solving Joe Manchin is hard, but what I can say is whatever Chris Saliza wrote in CNN uh, about Bernie's response to Joe Manchin, do, do the opposite of what he's he's suggesting because he wrote this fucking god awful piece about because so Bernie went on some ABC show uh, and just said yeah Joe, Joe Manchin was never because he killed the climate. Uh, you know, money for, for climate initiatives. Um, and the, they were framing it like, Oh, he, there was negotiations and he's changed his mind. And Bernie was like, no, he didn't change his mind. He was never negotiating good faith. He was never, he just strung us along. He's tanking Biden's agenda, which is a great way to frame it because then you're framing it positively towards the democratic party, which you kind of, kind of have to do. (laughs) 
in Bernie's position, but you're also because it's you know Biden's agenda, but you're also able to to hit hard on Joe Manchin for not being able to pass it. You're creating a lane for for you know a more uh, establishment Democrats to also criticize Joe Manchin because you know you you can come out and say oh Bernie he's tanking Biden's agenda then they can all follow suit but instead Joe Biden put out a statement that didn't even mention Joe Manchin by name and and Chris Saliza sucked him off for it he was like it's amazing it's of course Joe Manchin is never gonna come to your side if you criticize him it's like but he was never gonna come to your side anyway the only thing that they can do to solve the Joe Manchin problem is replace Joe Manchin I have to you know pick up a seat in the Senate. And uh, I think that it's a little more doable than I had been expecting before. Looking at some of these these Senate races, um, I mean, you know, I, I was less optimistic about Raphael Warnock winning re-election than I am now. Herschel Walker's thousand children coming out of the woodwork seem to have harmed his reputation. Um, John Fetterman is going to cruise to election in Pennsylvania. Um and J.D. Vance is not performing very well in Ohio, which I was also not expecting. So I don't know. It, it's possible, but um, what's not going to work is, you know, praising Joe Manchin or trying to strike a deal with him. There's no deal to be made. You could give him everything he wants in the world and he'd still vote no. Because he doesn't have to vote yes. He's probably not going to run for re-election. He, um, you know, he has enough money to sit pretty and he's doing the bidding of his donors. So they'll give him a cushy job sitting on the board of some oil company when he leaves. Um, it doesn't care about hurting the people of West Virginia. He was never there to represent them. And the, it's the, this West wing idea of politics that you can just sit down uh, across from someone who you disagree with and work out your ideological differences and come to, you know, uh, some middle ground. Like that doesn't work. It's, it hasn't worked. It was it was a fallacy of what government should operate uh, as and never actually has in reality. But that's the that's the position that so many of the like Democrats are coming from. Right. Like we can just we can find something to give him that he wants. There's nothing you can't. I mean, and I think that sort of very publicly criticizing him and and making sure everyone knows that he is at fault and, and harming his his image in that sort of way also probably won't work. He seems to not give a shit about that. So I, I'm genuinely of the position that the only way to solve the mansion problem is, is to replace him. And the only way to replace him is for Joe Biden to start signing executive order after executive order, giving voters what they want so that they go to the polls in the midterms, which I'm, I don't think he's going to fucking do. I'm also pretty skeptical about student loan forgiveness, although I desperately need it. Um, I would like for it to happen. I'm not, you know, relying on it happening because I'm certain it won't. But um, I mean, because they're not passing bills, right? They're not passing bills into law. So the only way Joe Biden can actually give people things that they need is through executive orders. He's not going to do that either. Right. Well, the interesting thing is um, from everything that we can tell that the legal ruling is that he actually does have the power to forgive student loans. It's one of the things that seems to be all of them. people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that seemed to be not really that contested. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he's floated it. And actually, this is what it's absurd to me. To float it and then not do it is to basically, um, it's a slap in the face with the under 40 set. Um, yeah. Or even actually a lot of people over 40. I'm over 40 and I still have to deal with student loans. Um, uh not to get into my own plight, but I'm one of these people who has played by the rules and and used the mechanisms to extend it based on my income that you're supposed to do and actually have already repaid the amount I borrowed, but owe more than what I borrowed still. Um, and this is more than this is more than 12 years after the fact. Yeah. So. So, uh, you know, I. And, he, and the fact that he also hasn't even floated compromise positions, such as just forgiving all the interest, which would actually be a big deal. I, I as a Marxist, think it's bullshit, but it's bullshit mm -hmm. I would take right now. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so it's it doesn't seem like they're even interested in winning. Yeah. But if they know they're going to lose, what, what I don't understand is, is he could do that. Or the other thing he could do is have the party punish Joe Manchin by primarying him since they know they're going to lose the Senate anyway. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's still up for grabs. But if it looks like they're going to use the Senate, I see no reason not to primary Joe Manchin. At the very least, they could strip him of his his committees. Right. He's the head of the Energy Committee. For the love of God, why was he ever 
given that position. Like he has no business being on that committee, let alone chairing that committee for the, for fuck's sake. But yeah, if they're going to lose primary him, what, what's, what is there to lose? Nothing. <laughs> Right. It's it's just like I said with the FDR thing. There's a knock-on effect even if you don't succeed with these threats. Mm -hmm. But when you will never show that you're willing to even consider them seriously, there is no knock-on effect. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, uh, so let's talk about one more thing that's happened today. I was just, you, you actually put me on to this. I, I've been so busy doing other things today and um, uh, that I didn't keep up with the news. But it seems like AOC and a few other Congress people got arrested today. Mm -hmm. um, for protesting and blocking a street. Uh, let's see, uh, Corey Bush, uh, Ilhan Omar, Ayanna Presley, and AOC seem to have been arrested. Uh, Rashida Tlaib, um, who else? Catherine uh, Clark. Catherine Clark. Um, uh, yeah, Jackie, uh, Jack, uh, Barbara Lee, uh, Jackie Spire, and Andy Levin seem to have been arrested as well so mm -hmm. uh the squad plus um uh and they were arrested for blocking a street um given the events of the last three and a half years that seems really minor but you know how the capitol police are and i admit it's going to complicate the dems narrative about the capitol police also during their june 6 hearings but uh i mean J june 6 july 6 hearings um it's been a long day <laughs> um uh what do you make of this um i think that the uh the act of doing it is right they went out there to get arrested that's a pretty common protest tactic civil mm -hmm. disobedience tactic get arrested get publicity um especially if you're a high profile figure i mean uh what's what's her name that you jane fonda and um Susan Sarandon do this all the time. They go to climate protests, they get arrested because it brings attention to those protests. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it. Um, I think what's wrong with what has happened now, because it's not, it's not even, of course the right wing is going to say, oh, they did it so that they could become victims and not what the intent obviously was, get arrested, bring attention to this action, whatever. Um, but I mean, there's, the the I don't even know how to describe them the the branch of the dumb left that is more willing to work with uh, with fascists than they are with uh, <laughs> like a anyone who who they think is a shit lib or whatever however they'll describe them um, are are making fun of them and saying like AOC pretended she had handcuffs on and and they're just doing everything they can to divert from away from what this was you know an act of civil disobedience regarding. Uh, overturning Roe and it's a way to keep attention on abortion rights because we're at the point where it's going to fade away from the you know the media right where a few mm. were like a month almost a month out now uh media has a short attention span they're moving on to other things this is still urgent they're still passing bills in the house uh biden is still working on executive orders whatever and and working out the the kinks of of enacting those uh I think it's a good way to keep attention on abortion rights. Um, and I, I wish that people would, I don't know, take one second. Because uh, is AOC perfect? No. Is Ilhan Omar perfect? Rashida Tlaib? I, Corey Bush? No, they're not perfect. Do they share my foreign policy? Largely not at all. But, you know, they're doing fucking something. And, and people are like, oh, go back to legislating. They're in the house. They have done the legislating. Mm -hmm. They did pass the bills. What else do you want them to fucking do except for keep the momentum and, and keep eyes on abortion as the media is is starting new narratives and, and diverting attention away from abortion right as these laws and these states are taking effect and impacting people um, and, you know, killing people really is what's happening. So, you know, to keep, yeah, and keeping the focus on it is good. And setting up a legal fight that I don't think people have formally thought through. I mean, uh, one thing I will say, liberals used to really annoy me with the Civil War talk. Um, and I, it, A, because it gives uh, weird conservatives who want to cosplay being the Viet Cong um, uh, some kind of hope. But also because there was no real, there was an ideological polarization, but there was not actually a legal and elite and 
an actual substantive basis. I still kind of think there isn't. In fact, I, my belief is if that ever really did start to happen, we just have a military hunt and it would put both sides down. Yeah. Um, but which, which is which actually is kind of the darkest possible timeline. Well, it's that or the other, the, the, the right winning are both dark possible timelines. But um, one of the other things that I think about this is that these states are passing laws that are also aimed at affecting the legality of other states. Yeah. So all the states' rights arguments that the Supreme Court can put out, the laws being crafted in these states are, are aimed to put them in direct odds with each other. And then the Supreme Court to basically selectively pick which states' rights they want to honor and which ones they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and since... Um, on other rulings that I don't think have gotten as much attention because they have been about mostly religious liberty. They have also been undoing even originalist, uh, you know, they've been undoing Scalia rulings because they bound them too much. And so they couldn't just do whatever partisan thing they wanted to do. And people have not been paying attention to that unless you're like a new atheist activist or something. And that plus this together sets up a very scary scenario where you have an unaccountable you've basically made the Supreme Court the actual de facto legislatures of the land at this point, particularly since the legislature won't act. And and frankly, uh, I also think it probably won't act under Republicans either. Yeah. Um, uh, although they will probably try to to symbolically pass a national abortion ban and probably it'll get stuck in the Senate um, strategically. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's somewhat worrying to see and to imagine and to think about how much power we're ceding to the Supreme court through this and judicial watchers have been warning people about it, but it's a very serious problem. I think for anybody's progressive agenda, if I mean, I don't want to encourage anyone to pull an Andrew an Andrew Jackson, but I, I kind of would have respect if uh, if Biden was like, "Well, I'm in charge of the executive and I have the guns," you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like I, I, you know, it would be that would set up a constitutional crisis. But the constitutional crisis is set up to happen anyway now. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I think Coy Robbins was right when he was talking about Scalia's dim view of the 14th amendment and it, it, Scalia is basically setting up a, not Scalia, um, uh, Clarence Thomas is basically now setting up a, a jurisprudential argument for undoing most of the 14th amendment, which is a big deal. Yeah. Um, because it would do a lot to decouple the, the states to national law and they can pretty much do whatever the hell they want. And for people who don't know before the civil war, the states could, they had state religions. They could pretty like the bill of rights didn't apply to state governments etc and so forth and that seems to be the world clarice thomas really wants yeah um and like you mentioned the the religion cases that went through the supreme court this uh this season it was tough like the the football case ridiculous one of the most i mean and and i've you know i've gone to law school i love to tell people that uh you they love to present the supreme court as nine amazing wizards who could never be wrong about anything, but for the love of God, like the way that Alito represented what happened in that case versus the video of what happened in that case, there could not be a stronger juxtaposition. He called this because of the, the coach was praying on the field and getting the students to pray with him uh, as a public school, obviously violation of first amendment, pressuring his team at a public school event funded by the school <laughs> to pray with him. But Alito was like, oh, it was a quiet, private prayer. There's a video of this guy at the fucking 50-yard line holding up helmets with a crowd of children kneeling around him. And he's, like, screaming, amen. Like, there was a state legislator there. Media was there. What kind of quiet public event is this? But, it, you know, it doesn't matter. And, and to the, you know, we discussed a little bit about um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg creating a justification for overturning Roe. But at the end of the day, you don't even need a good legal argument. You don't even no. need a good justification. They can write whatever the fuck they want. No. Ka Justice Kavanaugh cites to himself. He cites to his own law school writings in his fucking, you know, concurrences or, 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 uh, I, I haven't seen him do it in his, in any of his opinions, but he'll do it in his concurrences just shamelessly. 
I mean, fucking uh, Alito in the um, uh, Jackson's Women's Health, literally fuck or uh, the Dobbs case cited to uh, <laughs> fucking cited to uh, six seventeenth uh, century writing uh, from a person who thinks that you know rape in marriage doesn't exist and that you know you know burning at the stake is a-okay like what the fuck is that right. well what they're pro- also for for all the times the supreme court has made judgments on standing on the religious issue that you're talking no one actually had uh there's another not that one it's the one in maine where the supreme court is compelling maine to give money to religious organizations that violate yeah. Maine's provisions about sectarian teaching. So make it and best making. And, and since that one of the schools actually teaches an explicitly anti-Islamic um, curriculum, it's basically making Muslims in Maine of which there are a few pay for a, a sectarian curriculum that teaches that they're not, that they're yeah. not valid in their, you know, and, and that's wild to me. But what is even wilder is no one had standing to bring the suit. The EPA case, even more egregious. The the fucking the EPA case, right? West they were suing West Virginia and and these coal companies. They were suing for some hypothetical future potential legislation or re- sorry regulations that could be promulgated by the EPA. Nothing on the books. Nothing even in the works. They sued for the potential of these fucking regulations that didn't exist. There's not imminent. They didn't suffer irreparable harm. There's no basis for standing. And they fucking not, not only didn't dismiss the case, but ruled in favor of West Virginia and these coal companies, which were suing on behalf of energy, uh, regulated energy entities, despite the fact that a majority of these would be regulated uh, energy uh, uh, entities disagreed and wrote in favor of the EPA because it was going to bog them down in individual litigation if they weren't being regulated by the EPA on on GHGs as opposed to, you know, uh no regulations now they're they're going to court for, you know, every single time someone's suffering harm because of their emissions and there's no emission standards for for GHGs coming out of these factories. So it's actually worse for these companies, but it, it didn't that didn't even matter either the fucking supreme court said standing's not real we'll decide whatever the fuck we want climate change isn't real <laughs> right. just no despite the fact that we've twice held once unanimously that yes the epa can regulate ghgs we're just gonna throw that in the dumpster <laughs> right and and again it's important to emphasize for all the the prior even conservative arguments on who has the right to bring standing who who can bring these things they are they are gutting that that started with the shadow docket usage, but it's Ugh. really expanded now just explicitly where they're picking cases that blatantly have no standing. And, and what's weird is we're now in a world where I actually miss Antonin Scalia, which is, <laughs> which is, which is a, a sick, sad world. Yeah. Because he, for all that originalism was always an ideological prop, he at least was consistent about it. Yeah. There is no consistency here. And... The, the reason why that is particularly dangerous as far as liberal Jewish prison goes is no one really knows what the law is on several cases now, yeah. both in religious liberty and in um, Roe v. Wade, because there's no longer any documented standard for which you can apply anything. Um, mm-hmm. And there's almost also no will or no willingness to clarify it legislatively or for the executive. I mean, like, you know, it would be really fun, like I said, for them to like arrest the Supreme Court for violating standing and instigate impeachment, but they're not going to do that. Yeah. Um, and in fact, what a Biden's chief concerns is the appearance of the legitimacy of the court. It's which, not- <laughs> which is like, it's like, well, if the court's acting illegitimately, why are you concerned about the appearance of the? Ele- like-, like then create do what you have the constitutional ability to do impeach these fucking justices or pack the court to give it the legitimacy that you're concerned about right put justices on the court who and i always joke but genuinely put the youngest uh, legitimacy be damned put the youngest fucking fresh out of law school most liberal like you know barely practiced lawyers you can find who are going to live forever 
<laughs> we'll, we will never die. We'll live forever to, to reshape the court. Cause it's what you have to do. Don't nominate anyone in their fucking, you know, sixties, whatever young fucking people. I'm talking literally 25 years old, fresh out of law school. Cause they can serve forever. And I, I think that the fact that, that, the fact that the conservatives have been willing to do that and the Dems play a different game has been very frustrating. I I, I do understand the institutionalist fears of like, well, I don't want there to be more. What was it? Gavin Newsom said, I don't want there to be more people in the Supreme Court than in the House. And I'm like, well, honestly, the House should have been expanded a couple of decades ago, too. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, at this point, you're concerned about the legitimacy of government and which every poll indicates to you no one believes because of what government is doing. Yeah. It's so, the, it's the the institutions are making or they're delegitimizing themselves. It's not just like the public trust is eroding or or what have you. It, it's people are paying attention and seeing what these institutions are doing and reacting accordingly. Totally. And it's it's hard to imagine what that means. Um, I mean, I think another thing that we have to, to, to see, and I think it's going to be really pronounced, is yes, we've seen the the, the squad, um, and we we. I like you think you have to call them like you see them, and there are many things, particularly on foreign policy. I don't think you can forgive the squad for, but um, they do represent at least some response to the change of both the Democrats base into the country. Whereas I'm sorry, but I, this became, I've told the story a lot that I was watching the, the, the Trump impeachment. Um, I was out of the country for most of the Obama years. I paid attention to American politics. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Marxist I'm a political commentator, but I had not really paid attention to how old most of the Democrats in particular were because I was like, why are jokers like Ted Cruz able to rhetorically dance around these people? And then I watched the impeachment and I was like, Oh, except for the, except for the about 10 newbies, you know, the, either vaguely semi endorsed by the DSA or coming out of the progressive movement of the progressive caucus, they're ancient old as shit. Like, you got Diane Feinstein, oh barely, God. barely lucid. Someone who prosecuted women who got abortions before Roe passed, and we're supposed to look to her. Someone who hasn't had any need for abortion care in God, probably a century. <laughs> we're supposed to look to her to be to be the you know the leader in this dire moment. Like it, it's, I mean, what's this? Jerry Nadler shit his pants. In a hearing, I'm sorry, you're too old. You're too old to be in these positions. It's time to step down and embrace the the younger wing of the party, like the Republicans have done. Yeah, and uh, but I also think that does mean that that the younger wing of the party will have to be more aggressive in how it deals with with because that's the other thing the Republicans will do. I have pointed out that both the Tea Party and the Trumpists we're willing to take short-term losses for long-term gains. And I have to say, both the, the the Democratic Socialists and the progressives at the national level have not been willing to do that. Yeah. Um, um, I, at the state level, I've seen a little bit more, particularly in New York, where the DSA is particularly strong and they have a, they have a state-level organization with an actual caucus and cadres and things. But in general, we haven't seen that really translate to other localities yet. Um, that's going to be important. And if, and uh, not just to talk about the Democrats here, if the DSA doesn't do that, it's also probably not long to this world, at least not in the form that we currently know it. And we don't want it to go back to from 1982 to 2014, where it was, you know, 5,000 dairy dedicated socialist activists that were all in their sixties. Um, uh, which is what I remember that, you know, my like what I was actually surprised that the DSA was the, was the organization that was revitalized because I was like, OK, the only thing the DSA has for it is Barbara Ehrenreich and Bernie Sanders, which that's not a small thing actually ended up. <laughs> but um, and um, Cornell West, but like no one's in the DSA and then bam. So these things can change very quickly. And mm -hmm. and that's important to note. Um, I mean, 
you know, the DSA went from 5,000 members to 50,000 members in less than four years. Um, but I also do like to remind people that there are cults that are bigger than that, that, that are bigger than the current ADK and the DSA. Yeah. And um, we, and if anything, actually, we should give the DSA both criticism for not being ambitious, but also credit that during the 2015, 16 to 2019, it was actually punching above its weight class in numbers. Um, so that's something we have to deal with. That's, you know, I have strong criticisms of the DSA, but we are going to have to learn actually from the strategies, not from the content. In fact, this has been very frustrating to me about the socialist movement. There seems to be um, a movement that wants to tell the content of, or the cultural content of some of these right-wing movements, but not their strategies at all. Um, so, you know, we'll pick up culturally conservative talking points, or we're not, our, um, we, you know, we're going to work with these national conservatives to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I'm not going to name names, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, that, to me, is the exact wrong response. I think but, especially if I can just what you were saying about the right wing talking points, I think that's something that like I've seen DSA and the DNC, you know, just the same struggle with immensely is not knowing what the voters give a shit about going into the election because mm -hmm. the right wingers are going to frame it like, oh, this is going to be a the, the election is going to be a referendum on trans people or on um you know, uh, vax mandates or whatever, uh, CRT. But at the end of the day, most voters right now care about gas prices, the ability to get groceries. Um, do they have enough money to feed their families? You know, are they making a decent wage at their job when we've, you know, especially in this moment where we're seeing such a resurgence of labor, um, you know, getting really bogged down into the right wing framing of, you know, most people going to vote don't care or don't, don't know about this drag queen story hour bullshit that the conservatives are, are making the, the front, uh, you know, to rile up their core base, right? Because that's something their core base will get behind. But by and large, if you're trying to get the left leaning, you know, uh, low propensity voters to the polls, you have to fucking talk about the issues that they care about because they're not reaming or really like just sitting there, you know, crying about drag queen story hours. Like their main issue is gas prices. Like, what are you going to, what are you, <laughs> how are you continuing to frame the conversation uh, and how you're going to actually improve these conditions for these, these people and not just talking about CRT and getting caught up in that. Cause that's how, you know, they lost Virginia and, um, but I mean, it's it's difficult for the the DNC to do this because the, they're in power right now and they're not they're not fixing these problems. But I think the DSA is uniquely positioned to criticize the Democratic Party from the left on these issues if they can just stay on message and and not fall victim to the right wing framing of of you know what voters care about. Yeah, I, I find this very interesting because. Um... For the most part, yes, someone might get annoyed at, um, in fact, I've seen this in real life. Well, someone's going to get annoyed because HR's new rules about pronouns, and and then they're going to listen to Ben Shapiro. But when you actually spell out what Ben Shapiro's position really is and talk about mash wash and, the, and what they really want to do, which is the banning of transitioning altogether, um, people are like, oh, I don't agree with that. But So I'm like, okay, but we have seeded that to the other side and also played into it by presenting that as the primary locus of disagreement. And unfortunately I, I have to say, like I was this mutually constitutive game that the DNC likes to play uh, with like Josh Hawley um, during the abortion debates. And I'm like, you just let them set the framing um, so that we're going to be talking about trans issues and not reproductive rights issues because of, the use of some of some language that bothered like, me quite a bit. Like we, we, you, you actually set it up for the, fr mm -hmm. for them to have the framing given to them in that way, which both puts trans people in the, in the firing line. I want people to, 
I want people who think that I'm saying, oh, we shouldn't talk about it. No, it puts them in the firing line and puts them as if they're standing against women's reproductive health yep. and all other people with wombs reproductive health. Um, and and I was I was I brought this up many times lately, but it, it's really stuck with me. I was listening to Brianna Joy Gray talk to my friend Pascal Robert about this debate about NPR and the tampons. You, you probably know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And my response was, you don't have to throw trans people under the bus, but you also, when you're not talking to a left audience, don't have to use that nomenclature. You could have simply just said people. That is exactly what I've been saying since I saw that clip that everyone's been sharing of the the law professor, this is from Yale, mm -hmm. debating with Josh Hawley. It's you just say people move on. Just say people and move on. Don't let them steer you off message because th that's exactly it. You don't have to say people with uteruses, people who menstruate, you know, uh, people who are capable of getting pregnant. They all start with people. Shorten it to people. And then right. and now you're not opening the conversation to be an attack on trans people who, for the love of God, have not been able to catch a fucking break already enough already. No. And like and, and this way you can continue to advocate for what you were there to advocate for reproductive rights, which, of course, impact trans people as well. But now you're not steering the conversation away from reproductive rights and into, you know, uh, the legitimacy of tr being trans or pronouns or what have you. You're just staying on t on subject on topic and you have the 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 benefit of you know not alienating the people who are are not super attuned to all of this but also being able to get your message across and also not putting trans people like you said in the firing line right yeah. <laughs> because not for the firing line, but also not throwing them under the bus we don't have yeah. to, we, we don't have to like like there are natural language ways uh, you might hear it i sometimes slip on the say latino i don't like latinx Actually, because I live in I live in a mostly Latin part of town, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of universally rejected now as a sign of. And I will say that it's not even true that it was a concept invented by white people. It actually comes out of Argentina, which then, but it's still a kind of a privileged discourse in that community. But yeah. I don't have to throw anyone under the bus. There actually is a natural language answer in English already. Just say Latin. Remove the gendering mm -hmm. without adding anything new that is a specific cultural signifier to you. You can use that when people want you to use it. But you don't have to use it with the general public. Mm -hmm. um, but you also don't have to throw these groups under the bus either. Like and so what I, I keep on getting stuck. I'm like, why are you setting this up in a binary as if we don't have an option to approach this to people who are more who may not be as aware of these of these changes and norms? And we do have to remember on trans issues, the change was fast enough that most of it happened while I was out of the country. <laughs> like, and I was only gone for eight years, but literally, like our entire language changed about it. Like we were still talking about transsexuals and transvestites when I left. Um and I'm I'm not saying it's bad. I think it's actually good. And it took me a, it took me a while to catch up. But I'm also just sometimes just baffled by why we are actually taking the bait. Yeah. Um. Similar stuff with CRT, and I, I've seen liberals actually defend CRT, um, critical race theory, uh, as as just anti racism. Like it's actually not. It was um, one of the most frustrating things that I would see was people saying, actually, CRT is good and it should be taught in schools. I, as someone who went to law school and learned CRT, no, it shouldn't be. Your child shouldn't be learning critical race theory. Your child is not going to fucking understand it. Your, your chi child should be learning math and social studies and, you know, social skills and how to socialize with other people at school. That's what they should be focusing on. Or for the love of God, maybe some public school will teach proper sex ed. But CRT is not appropriate to be taught even at an undergrad level. That is graduate school level theory. It has no business being in fucking, you know, uh, primary, secondary school. Um, and, and framing the conversation that it's it's should be taught in school is ridiculous. Like anti-racism and CRT are to two completely different things. And once you start combining the two now you are delegitimizing the argument of what crt really is because otherwise you can always respond to the concerns that's law school level theory and it's again it, like crt isn't even something that assigns moral judgment or value it's just a framework through which you can analyze disparate impact of laws on racial groups um and 
once you start interjecting anti-racism into that, you take away that nuance that that is sort of like a strong pushback to conservative framings of what CRT is, because of course anti-racism does not is not like neutral when it comes to morality. Of course, it assigns moral judgment and blame, and so mm. it, it was just such a massive misstep. And it was not a problem in the first place if they had just kept fucking just kept laser focused on the actual issues and not buy, bought into it and not not allowed it to become, you know, the the zeitgeist that it was, they might have fared better in some of those gubernatorial races. Well, it's one of the things my friend Pascal Robert actually talked about how, um, and my partner who is uh, is a progressive activist got really pissed at me when I repeated it, but I was like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Unfortunately, the way CRT has been weaponized, it's done way more for the right than it's ever done for a person of color. And... And it's not because of the theory, even. I, we're not we're not debating the merits of the theory. Do I think CRT is totally compatible with Marxism? No, I don't actually. Uh, do I think it's it's bad? No, it's 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 a legal framework that I don't entirely agree with, and might have graduate level arguments about elements of its claims, but that I don't think is the same as anti racism. Yeah. But unfortunately, it was a. There's this kind of hip anti-racism that emerged amongst very amongst a certain set of liberals, particularly right after the the, the George Floyd BLM protests, that really adopted onto like Raman uh, Abraham Etz Kendi's and Robert D'Angelo's framework, which did have elements, although not really even that was full CRT of CRT in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then. There had also been this trend to incorporate legal scholarly insight into pedagogy in the training of teachers. And again, questionable, but it didn't come up unless you were grad schools. In fact, even most of the anti-racist teachers that I knew rolled their eyes at it. But because of that, that was something that a few conservatives were able to pull out of teacher trainings and then throw to the entire world as if it had been readily taught in schools. And you can get frustrated teachers to basically betray their profession and go... Like this, you know, I'm a teacher. So like this actually really, this is like my line now. If you start making the analogy that teaching CRT is grooming and teaching socially emotional learning is grooming, not only are you basically portraying us all as sexual predators um, and all, all queer people as sexual predators and equating the two. Yeah. Um, but you are also, um, you're also betraying the profession in a very real way. Um, however, since there was this, there is, you know, that response that liberals have, anything conservatives say is bad, we must defend, um, even if we don't understand it. Because I, I'd be like, do you know what critical race theory even is? It is not just anti-racism. Like, you should quit saying that. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I... I was very shocked and that like I've actually had to lead workshops here in Utah and I, and I'm going to admit this, like you don't have to drop your politics, but uh, you do have to think about where you're teaching and I'm sorry, but now you can't use social justice language anymore because it's now been weaponized. And if you don't adjust to that, you're putting yourself and your students in the target anymore. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean you have to change your frameworks. You don't. All right but you do have to change the way you talk about it. And that weirdly seemed to really be aligned with people. And I was like, why is the way you, why is how you say this more important than what you say when you know how you say this is now being weaponized against you? Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's just like a refusal to admit that there's a time and a place, right? There's a time and a place for, you know, I mean, and when it comes to Robert D'Angelo, right, this is like uh, rich, upper middle class white women who just got into social justice because it's, you know, George Floyd protests just happened. They want to feel like they can do something. Robin D'Angelo presents to them a way that they can they can feel less guilty about the, you know, decadence of their lifestyle and not ever actually engaging in any sort of anti-racist action. Um, uh, so, so they can like, they, they can feel like they're helping, but in, in reality, they're just acknowledging they have privilege, which I guess to some extent, yeah, sure, I mean, it's good to acknowledge that absolutely. But like, you're not like, it's, 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 
it was just a hot thing to have in your it was like a Robin Angelo specifically it was it was just like a trend like ooh we should have the speaker come to our corporate you know event because you know she's really popular right now or whatever we should start doing these trainings because like it's it's like the best on the market currently but it was never it's not like these corporations that were using her trainings give a damn about racism it was it was just like it was popular at the time and they're also they don't want to get sued they have to do right. these discrimination trainings <laughs> right they, they changed their language but i guarantee you they didn't change the racism inherent by accident not even intentional in their algorithms this is something i realized when i was working for an insurance company 20 years ago that the algorithms actually because of the way justice works because of structural and wealth gaps would always replicate and exacerbate the already existing conditions without anyone even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Right now that's a, that actually is a critical race theory kind of framework about systemic racism. But unfortunately the way this was approached, particularly in the last five years, actually in the beginning of privileged talk politics again, about, about 10 years ago, um, what that did was conflate the systemic and the personal, because what people sort of focus on was like unconscious bias. And yeah, unconscious bias is a problem, but it's actually a completely separate problem from both systemic racism and conscious bigotry. Like mm -hmm. they're three different serious, but different problems. And we started moving back and forth between them. And unfortunately it is that moving back and forth has enabled the right to also move back and forth between them to attack us. And what I think people have been surprised about, it's even been effective amongst some communities of color. And um, and you started seeing people recognizing this when they noticed that there was a lot of Latinos and Asian people in the leadership of, of things like the Proud Boys, but then, but it was still a really small portion of the population, very niche. But there's been a, a shift in the last two or three years that I think has nothing to do with this cultural politics and has to do with things have not gotten better under the Democrats, where... Mm -hmm this is really beginning to, to, to gain steam in certain communities that, that feel like nobody represents them anyway. Um, the, the biggest one is the Latin community, when you think about it, because the, the immigration concerns, um, they, know, they feel they're never going to be addressed anyhow, one way or the other. So why, why die on that hill anymore? And they also feel... You know, they, a lot of them are not anti-vaxxers, but they do feel like they were left economically strapped during the lockdowns um, because, of, frankly, they were. Yeah. Like, you can't survive off of three payments of $1,500 over a course of two years. <laughs> like Most like, of which came from Trump. So that's also <laughs> fucking not reflecting very well on the Democrats. No. Right. So it's it, it's not a great situation. Um you know, and the Democrats haven't even taken the credit for like, uh, and it happened under Trump, so they can't fully take the credit for the biggest, most progressive thing they did, which was the expansion of unemployment. Um, but even that, they're hesitant to take the credit for. So what are you going to do? Um, well, we've been talking for about an hour and a half, and I need to let you go. So um, what? You, what uh, first, what? anything you'd like to say in closing, and then what would you like to plug? Um, I guess anything I could, uh, I would just say, uh, focus on local politics, state politics, national politics is, is a harder game to get into, you know, harder barrier of entry. So easier to focus on state, local, more you can do at the state and local level. You'll see the impacts in your life and the lives of the people around you. Um, and then you can follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Ravana. You can see my videos for Rebel HQ on YouTube um, and listen to my podcast, Taking the L, and also listen to Red Flag Pod. It's really fun. I have a good time recording that. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show. And um, uh, people should check out your work. And there's a lot of it. Like, uh, <laughs> um, I, I have been like, wow, I thought I overproduced. But um, <laughs> but it, you're smart and at least do it on multiple brands. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for coming on and uh, have a great evening. Thank you.